Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir up, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, Greg is going to lead us and a couple of songs. Number 182. <clears throat> Number 182. Let's stand together as we offer this sacrifice of praise. <clears throat> Faith is the brightest evidence of things beyond our sight. It is its through the veil of sense and dwells in heavenly light. It sets minds past in present view. Oh, 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 oh. 
I'd like to turn your attention this morning to the passage that we read earlier, Second Peter in chapter 1. There is a question that arises in the mind of Christians from time to time, and that is, am I truly an elect born-again child of God? This question has arisen in my mind as I'm sure it has some of yours. In fact, from the time that I was very small, I wondered about this because I was raised in a church that taught election. You see, there are some days we just don't feel like children of God. Is that not true? But we don't base our religion on feelings. We base our religion on evidence, evidence from the Word of God. And the matter of our election and our calling is a matter that should concern us according to the Word of God. Look at verse 10 of the chapter that we read. Here, Peter admonishes us, and he says, Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Notice, first of all, he admonishes us to diligence about this question. Now, diligence is constant, and earnest effort to accomplish what is undertaken, persistent application and endeavor. In other words, we are to be constantly and earnestly giving ourselves to effort to determine the sureness of our election and our calling. Now, the next thing we must determine is how do we make it sure? There are two ways to make something sure. You can make something sure, which means to make something firm and fast by doing that yourself. Or you can make it sure by being assured in your mind that it is firm and fast. Now, when it comes to the matter of election, we don't make that sure in the sense of accomplishing it. According to Ephesians 1 and verse 4, that was accomplished before the foundation of the world. We read, according as he hath chosen or elected us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and well without blame before him in love. Notice, he chose us before the foundation of the world, and he did it not that we were holy, but that we should be holy. And as far as our new birth is concerned, we had nothing to do with that either. According to John 1 and verse 13, we read, that we were born, that is our new birth, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So while there is nothing that we can do to accomplish either our election or our regeneration, there is a lot that we can do to be assured in our minds that this is true in regard to us. Look at the second half of that verse in Second Peter 1 verse 10 where he tells us for if ye do these things ye shall never fall notice we can gain assurance of our election and our salvation by doing certain things not to accomplish it but to gain assurance in our mind and what are these things that we are to do look back at verse 5 where we have these things beginning to be listed And we are told here again, and beside this, giving all diligence. Notice that word diligence, to give constant and earnest effort to accomplish something. We are to give all diligence to add to our faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Notice here, they are listed as things that we add unto our faith. And then we go on to read in verse 8 another benefit to adding these things to our faith besides the assurance of our calling and our election. Verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, notice, first of all, they're not supposed to be just in us. They're supposed to be both in us and abounding. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we won't be unfruitful or barren, it is obvious that by adding these things to our faith, 
that will make us fruitful Christians. And according to John 15 and verse 5, we read that if we are fruitful Christians, we have evidence that Christ is dwelling in us and that we are dwelling in him. More assurance of our election and our regeneration. John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If we are abiding in Christ, we are bringing forth fruit. Another benefit that can be gained by adding these things to our faith is listed in verse 9. Put in a negative sense here, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So if we have these things in us, we won't be found in a state of blindness, will we? But we will have sight. We will have sight forward. We will be able to see it far off. And we will have sight backward. We will have a remembrance of the fact that Christ purged our sins. We will, in other words, be demonstrating in our lives the fact that we remember that Christ forgave our sins. Now, what does that man, how does that manifest itself in our life? Look at Titus 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. We read concerning Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. There is the purging of our old sins and purify unto himself a peculiar people. And here's the phrase we want, zealous of good works. If we are living with a remembrance of our sins being purged, we will be zealous of good works. Think back on when you first were converted, as the song says, that you found out that all my sins were forgiven, Jesus paid it all. Think how that motivated you to zealousness for Jesus Christ when you found out that you had no more responsibility for any of the sins that you ever committed, that Jesus paid it all. Now I ask you this morning, is that zealousness and that memory still fresh within your mind? If so, you are not blind. Notice the next thing that we see in this verse, as far as our sight goes, is that we will be able to see afar off. Now if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 11, We'll see an example of some people that could see afar off. Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 13. Speaking of these heroes of faith, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And drop down to verse 16. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Notice, when it came to this earth, they considered themselves pilgrims and strangers on this earth. But their eyes were focused far off. Their eyes were focused on heaven, the place that God had prepared for them. Now, if we live with these things in our mind, the fact that our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven, we will have a constant remembrance, first of all, that two of our biggest problems in life have been taken care of. That is our sin and where we are going to spend eternity. It almost rhymes, doesn't it? My sins are forgiven, I'm going to heaven. Keep that in your mind, almost like a jingle. If you keep that before you, it makes the, the problems you face in life much easier. The next benefit that we notice from adding these things diligently to our faith is found in verse 11 of 2 Peter chapter 1. where we read 
for so an infant shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now to understand what this verse is telling us, we have to break it down. First of all, let's define what entrance is. An entrance is an act of entering in. Okay. And it says that an entrance shall be ministered to us. Now when minister is used as a verb as it is here, it means to furnish or supply. In other words, Peter is telling us that an act of entering will be furnished or supplied us into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what is this everlasting kingdom that he is speaking of? Turn back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, where this kingdom is prophesied. Now in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we read, And in the days of these kings, speaking of the Roman Empire, if you go back into the context, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Notice, it's an everlasting kingdom. It shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Notice, it shall never be destroyed, and it shall stand forever. In other words, an everlasting kingdom is being prophesied of here. And we know from other lessons that that kingdom that was set up at the time of the Roman Empire, which was the time of Christ, is the gospel church in which you are sitting in. In other words, Peter is telling us that we, if we add these things diligently to our faith, we will be furnished or supplied with an abundant entering into Christ's church. Adding these things to our faith furnishes us with, with a way of entering into the real essence of what a church is intended to be and what you are sitting in today. You won't be just bench warmers. In regards to this church, I guess there's no benches. You won't be seat warmers. You will be realizing, though, the real benefits that God's church has to offer. Now, now that we've seen the benefits of adding these things to our faith, which are fruitfulness, sight, assurance of our election and calling, and abundant entrance into Christ's kingdom, we must next examine the faith itself. The faith that we are told to add to is described for us in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter addresses this epistle. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Notice there are four characteristics spoken of of this faith in verse 1. First of all, it's an obtained faith. Now, if you obtain something, you were not born with it. It did not come naturally to you. It's something that you procured or you acquired. That's the definition of obtained. Secondly, this faith is a like faith with us. Peter speaking as an apostle, and as an elect child of God, says that it's a like faith. And one characteristic I want to pull out of the like faith of Peter is mentioned in 1 Peter 1, verse 9, where he says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. A like faith with the apostles and the elect faith results in the salvation of your souls. It is also called a precious faith, if something is precious. It is of great cost or value. And the fourth thing, and a very important thing to notice about this faith, is what, is it, what it is obtained through. According to this verse, this faith is obtained through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now compare this faith with a faith that's generally taught in the churches of America today. The faith that teaches you that 
all men have this faith, that all men can exercise it and believe in Jesus Christ. And if they do that, it will result in eternal life. But if they don't, it won't. And notice what else they teach about that faith. They don't teach that it's obtained by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They teach that it obtains the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a great difference between a faith that obtains the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ and a faith that is obtained by that. There is a faith that obtains the righteousness of God. It is not the sinner's faith. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. According to Romans 3 and verse 22, we read, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference now if you have a different Bible it may not read that way it may read even the righteousness of God which is by faith in Jesus Christ but according to the Word of God the faith that obtains the righteousness of God is the faith of Jesus Christ not the sinners faith the sinners faith according to 2nd Peter 1 is obtained through that righteousness. Our faith is obtained by the righteousness of God as a gift of God's grace. There is a big difference between a faith that obtains and a faith that is obtaining. Now we've seen what we build on. Now let us examine these things that we are to add to our faith. Notice in verse 5, that the first thing that we are to diligently add to our faith is virtue. I first read that word virtue. I didn't know what that meant. And here it was the first thing that I was to add to my faith. I could not pull a definition out of my head, so I looked it up, of course. Now, virtue in its primary meaning is the power or operative influence inherent in a supernatural or divine being. An example of virtue used in this way is found in Luke 6, verse 19. The power or operative influence inherent in a supernatural or divine being. Luke 6, 19, where we're t discussing in this chapter uh, Jesus healing the multitudes. And it says in verse 19, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Notice, there was a power there in a divine being, Jesus Christ, that went out of him and healed all these people of their sicknesses. Now that is obviously not what we are looking for to add to our faith. But there is another meaning of virtue that fits. And that is that virtue also means conformity of life and conduct with the principles of morality, voluntary observance of the recognized moral laws or standards of right conduct, abstention on moral grounds from any form of wrongdoing or vice. In other words, virtue is conforming your life to a set of standards that are the opposite of wrongdoing or vice. In other words, we are conforming our life to the Word of God and we are avoiding sin. Notice in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, it says that we are called to virtue. Now, where are we called to virtue? Is not the gospel itself a call to virtue? As it goes out, we are told to repent of our sins to believe on Jesus Christ and to walk in obedience unto Him. That is, to begin conforming your life to the Word of God. Paul tells us in Romans 1 that he was separated unto this. We read in Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, 
separated unto the gospel of God. And then drop down to verse 5, where he says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Paul was separated unto the gospel of God, called to be an apostle for obedience to the faith among all nations. In other words, to call them to virtue, to call them to conform their life to the commands of Jesus Christ. We see this laid out for us quite clearly in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 3, we read, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And notice verse 2 here, that he should no longer, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. He was to conform his life different from what he was before and conform it to the will of God. Notice what they did before. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. These were the things that the Gentiles and many of us were involved in before we were called to virtue by the gospel. Now, this, gospel, this call to virtue, in fact, is a part of the seal of a gospel ministry. According to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19, Nevertheless, 2 Timothy 2, 19, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Notice a singular seal. There's one seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. There is your doctrine of election. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ and depart from iniquity. There is your call to virtue. A good and fairly dramatic example of this is when our pastor preached in Las Vegas. He went out there and he preached election. He called them to conform their life, to believe on Jesus Christ. And those people did not have a lot of knowledge. They'd only heard him preach for a couple of days. Now granted, you can get quite a bit of knowledge in a couple of days from our pastor's preaching, but not as much knowledge as what they have today. And yet when he called them to virtue or to conform their lives, what was the first thing they did? They were baptized, and many of them quit the jobs that they were involved in in the casino industry. They immediately made a decision based on the knowledge they had to conform their lives to Christ. They did not need several years of instruction to do that. Notice also that virtue is something that we are to continue in and abound in. We're told this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1 reads, Furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk. There he, he told them how they were to walk in their lives to conform it to the word of God and to please God that is pleasing to God. So ye would abound more and more. It's not just something that's involved with the first call of the gospel that we hear, that we hear, but it is something that we are to continue in and it is something that we are to abound in in the rest of our lives. Now, the next thing on this list is knowledge. Add to your virtue knowledge. Now, there's a good reason why knowledge must come after virtue. Because without virtue, knowledge would not be acquired. According to a familiar text in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1 
It's in verse 7. We read, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Notice, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. And what is the fear of the Lord? That also is a familiar text. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. In other words, without adding virtue to our faith, without a hatred of evil, we will not be able to acquire knowledge. Now, being filled with knowledge is very much connected with a virtuous life. According to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul is talking about a prayer that he offered for the Colossians. And he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And notice, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful, which is one of the things we are trying to accomplish by adding these things to our faith, and every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Notice, walking worthy unto the Lord, being fruitful, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Virtue and knowledge are very connected. In fact, eternal life itself, which is what we are trying to determine that we have in making our calling and election sure, eternal life itself, which we are given in the new birth, is described as the ability to know the true God. Look at John 17. We cannot even gain knowledge of the truth or the true God unless the Lord has regenerated us. John 17, we read in verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, speaking of Jesus Christ, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Here we have election again. Eternal life given to certain ones, those whom the Father gave to Jesus Christ. And in verse 3, and this is life eternal. What is this eternal life? And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. In other words, life eternal is an ability to know the true God. It doesn't take eternal life to know false gods. There are many false gods and many people that worship them. But it takes eternal life in you to know the true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The one that, Jesus, that God sent from heaven is the one that we want to know. Paul is our example and he valued this knowledge very highly. Look at Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 8 we read Yea, doubtless and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Notice he counted all things but loss and Paul lost quite a bit. Paul was a very important man in his country, had a very high standing, had a very great education, he had a lot of knowledge, and he persecuted the Christians. But he says that he counted all those things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and he goes on to say that he did suffer the loss of all things for that knowledge. But he counted them as dung that he might win Christ. Now, are we that committed to the knowledge of the true God and of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we obtain this knowledge? Well, we know that we obtain it through the Word of God, but God has provided pastors and teachers for us to obtain this knowledge. We read in Ephesians 4, and he gave some apostles, beginning in verse 11, some prophets and some evangelists 
and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The work of the ministry is to bring us into the unity of the faith and into the knowledge of the Son of God. And just to show you a couple other benefits of the knowledge of God, going back to the passage we began with, 2 Peter chapter 1, we notice that all these things that we are adding to our faith are given to us through knowledge. Look at verse 3. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. It is by growing in the knowledge of God that we are able to add these things to our faith. And another point is brought out in verse 2. We are told in verse 2 that grace and peace are multiplied unto us through the knowledge of God. If we're lacking peace in our life, if we're lacking grace in our life, we need more grace. If we'd like more added, if we'd like more multiplied in our life, we can gain that through the knowledge of God by applying ourselves to the preaching of the Word and to this book. We can grow in both grace and peace in our lives. Now, we've come to the next one that we want to add to our faith. And that is temperance. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance. Temperance is defined as the practice or habit of restraining oneself in provocation when you are being provoked and you restrain yourself, you're showing temperance. It's also the practice of restraining oneself in passions and desires. Habitual moderation. You make a habit of being moderate in your life if you are temperate. Self-control. You are in control of yourself. Self-restraint. You are able to restrain yourself. That is what temperance is. Now, temperance must be added to knowledge because a little knowledge can lead to pride. Look at 1 Corinthians 8 with me. Now as touching things, beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And then he says a phrase that's interesting, knowledge puffeth up. And is that not true of man? And is that not our tendency by nature that we get a little knowledge and we start to think we're something? Right? But Paul tempers that inclination in us in verse 2 he says and if any man think that he knoweth anything he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know notice we must restrain ourselves when we get a little knowledge not to think of ourselves more highly than what we ought to another thing that is involved in adding temperance to knowledge is the fact that with knowledge comes liberty if you will recall when, when you were converted into this church that you found that there was liberty in your life that you didn't have before in, in many areas. Now there may have been areas where you didn't have the same liberty but there, there was liberty in your life that came with knowledge of the truth. And that is what Paul is dealing with in this chapter here of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He's dealing in reference to meat offered unto idols. Look at verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. In other words, idols aren't real gods. Once you're converted away from that, you don't have to be frightened of those things. They're man-made. 
there is none other God but one. For though there be for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus, by whom are all things, and we by him. But then he says, How be it there is not in every man that knowledge. Not every man has a full grasp of that fact that those idols are nothing, and that there is but one God. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. There's the man that could not get it over in his mind that that idol was nothing, had bothered his conscience that that meat had been offered to it. So when he ate that, all he could think in his mind that it was offered to an idol. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Notice, the ones that had this knowledge had the liberty of that knowledge to be able to eat that meat. It didn't bother them to eat that meat. They didn't care who it had been offered to them. It was just meat to eat. Okay? But it was a liberty that they had to be careful with. For, in verse 10, if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? That man with a weak conscience sees a strong Christian eating that meat. And he thinks, well, if he can do it, it must be all right. But his conscience is not clear on that matter, so it isn't right to him. And through thy knowledge, verse 11, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. See, he did not eat it in faith, which could lead to actual physical death in this world. And verse 12, But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So, here we are. A man has correct knowledge. This meat offered to an idol is not wrong to eat. But, by not using temperance in regard to that, that man eating it in front of a brother that had a problem with that, he was sinning against that brother and he was sinning against Christ. Even though was correct. That is why we have to add temperance to our knowledge in areas of our life where others of our brethren might have a problem and we might have liberty. We have to be careful in those areas not to offend the conscience of a weaker brother. Now, Paul exhorts us to temperance in the next chapter here. Notice it's also spoken of in the context of evangelism. Temperance is importance for the furtherance of evangelism, which is what we are trying to do at this time in this church. We read in 1 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He does not exercise his full liberties in whatever he is involved in. He practices restraining himself. He keeps himself habitually moderated under self-control, self-restraint. Now, he says, they do it. A man that runs a marathon, he's temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They like coming over that line first. There's a lot of praise and honor and glory for a man that crosses that finish line first. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Notice Paul's eyes, where are they fixed? They're fixed afar off, looking for that incorruptible crown that was laid up for him in heaven. And he says, But I keep, oh, I therefore so run not as uncertainly, and so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul knows exactly what he's doing when he's running and when he's fighting. He's not just swinging his arms and flailing wildly hoping that he hits something. He knows exactly what he's doing. He says in verse 27, But I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 
Notice Paul exhorting us and telling us how he practiced temperance in his life, moderation in all things. In fact, without, without temperance, we are defenseless against our three main enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as the Scriptures put it. This is clearly brought out in Proverbs 25, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 25 and, and, and verse 28 tells us, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In other words, if you lack self-control in your life, you're no better than a city that has no walls. Well, that doesn't mean too much to us today, but back in those days before planes and gunpowder and flight, walls were the protection to those cities. So without walls, a city was defenseless, even as we are defenseless if we have no rule or self-control over our own spirit. Paul prays for this strength in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning of verse 14, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with all might by his Spirit in the inner man. Notice Paul praying there for the Ephesians that they would remain strong by the Spirit of God in the inner man. In other words, that's a call to be able to exercise temperance in their lives. The next thing that we add to temperance is patience. Patience something that, especially nowadays, is a real problem. We live in a world that seems to be picking up momentum all the time. When you live in a world that's geared towards speed, any little thing that happens tends to disrupt that, make you impatient. See, patience is the practice or quality of bearing or enduring pain, trials, or the like, not necessarily large trials, even small trials, with composure and without complaint or discontent something that's sorely lacking in this world today. We need patience because, first of all, there is suffering to be endured in this world. Jesus in John 16, verse 33, and talking to his disciples, he tells them, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation." But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But as long as we're here, we will suffer tribulation. And we notice that this is repeated again in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. In Philippians 1, 29, Paul writes, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him. Notice it's given unto us to believe on Him, but that's not the only thing that is given unto us, but also to suffer for His sake. And isn't that what we tell new converts when they're converted to the truth? That in many ways their troubles are not over. In some ways they're just beginning. We also need patience because our faith will be tested. This is brought out in James chapter 1. Our faith will be tested to see whether we have the true faith of God or not. And James writes in James 1 verse 2, Brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Temptations here being used in the sense of testing or trying. Notice the attitude that 
he exhorts us to. Count it joy when you fall into testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It is this testing of our faith that exercises our patience. But the end of its work, the end of patience, being that we will be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Obviously a good characteristic to develop. Now, we are told that we will have afflictions in this world, but they serve a purpose. They serve to keep our eyes fixed once again afar off. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Sometimes our afflictions seem heavy, don't they? But look how he describes it here. For our light affliction, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 4, for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look, now we're looking again, While we look not at the things which are seen, our eyes aren't focused on our troubles in this present world, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our afflictions serve to keep our eyes focused on heaven and to take our affections away from this world. We also need patience in our lives because... We do not always see immediate results to our labors, nor do we see immediately immediate fulfillment of the promises of God in our lives. We can see this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, we read, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed towards his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you to show the same diligence. Notice again a call to diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful or not to be lazy but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Through faith and through patience, patience being waiting, we inherit the promises. And then he gives us an example of a man that we are to follow. Abraham. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham had been promised that he would be the father of many nations and that his seed would be like the sand of the seashore, like the stars in multitude. Abraham got past the age of bearing children. Sarah was old. He had no children. But it says... He patiently endured. And what happened? He received the promise. He received Isaac. And out of Isaac, we all have been blessed because it was in that line of Isaac that we received the Lord Jesus Christ. But Abraham is our example to patiently endure. We may not see results immediately, both from our work or from the promises of God. Many of the promises of God will be fulfilled unto us in heaven, not on this earth. But we are to patiently endure. Now, the next thing we want to look at is godliness. Godliness is the quality of being godly. 
And to be godly is to have the qualities appropriate to, characteristic of, and befitting God. I'd like you to turn to the epistle of Peter, but First Peter in chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. We will look at a, a quality that is appropriate to and characteristic of and befitting our God. Starting at verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Notice, in our ignorance we fashioned ourselves according to lusts. Now we have knowledge. But as He, that is God, which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now that word conversation means just your act of living not referring here to the way we use it today as far as speech goes. It's used here just your act of living. The way you live is what your conversation means. So, he says, So be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, Be ye holy for I am holy. In other words, we see here that godliness is a call to holiness. Being as God, having the characteristics is being holy. And to be holy is to be free from all contamination of sin and evil, morally and spiritually perfect and unsullied. Now, we are called to be holy. That is, to be free from all contamination of sin. But we are sinners, are we not? How do we accomplish this? According to 1 John 1, there is a way to accomplish this, to keep ourselves holy. 1 John 1, beginning at verse 7, we read, But if we walk in the light, notice we're not blind, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Look at that word, cleanseth. That's in the, the present tense. That's a process going on. As long as we are walking in the light, as He is in the light, we are constantly being cleansed from all sin. But then He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, in other words, we will sin. We're sinners. Sin will enter into our life. So what do we do about it? Verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we sin, we confess our sins. And He's just and faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, we have no contamination of sin or evil upon us. That is how we remain holy. That is how we manifest godliness in our lives. And if you need further motivation to godliness, back up a page. Look at Second Peter chapter three, beginning at verse ten. Here again we are looking ahead to an event in the future of this world. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's a day coming when all this stuff is going to be burned up in one big ball of fire. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? When we look ahead and see that all this stuff is going to be destroyed anyway. Nothing here is going to remain. That ought to motivate us to godliness in our life. Looking for, here we are again, looking ahead 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. See, our, our eyes and our affections aren't focused on this place. If your affections are focused on this place, you're going to be sadly disappointed. It's going to be burned up. There will be nothing left. But nevertheless, we, according to His promise, that we are waiting for patiently, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There again, we are looking afar off. We have our eyes focused on the fact that our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven. That's where we're going to end up. This place is not it, folks. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. Here we are again. Be diligent. Constantly apply yourself that ye may be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. In other words, godly. Having godliness in your life. Being found in Him without spot and blameless. See, there's nothing in this world worth sacrificing your holiness for. The next thing on this list is brotherly kindness. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Christians are to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In other words, to be kindly affectioned is to be kindly disposed or inclined to one another with brotherly love. We show brotherly kindness, in other words, with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. We prefer our brethren above ourselves. We put them in preference to ourselves and our own desires. Now, we have received a lot of teaching lately on the subject of how we are to deal together with brethren. We received a series on togetherness. We were given a series that balanced that out on minding your own business. Now, if we have been diligently applying ourselves to that knowledge that we have gained, we should be showing a lot of brotherly kindness in our lives. So I am not going to deal with that subject at great length, but I would like to point out a couple more facts about brotherly love. And uh, the first one is in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 11. Once again, we're trying to maintain a state of sight, not a state of blindness. But here we are told, He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. If we hate our brethren, we are blinded. We are in darkness. Also, 1 John 3, verses 14 and 15. Showing brotherly love is a good way to make our calling and election sure. If we wonder about our calling and election and we are showing brotherly love, we have good evidence of that in our lives. 1 John 3, verse 14, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. If we love the brother, we have life. If we hate the brother, we are in a state of death. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now we are told, after brotherly kindness, that we are to add charity to that. I suppose you think I'm all going to 1 Corinthians 13. I am, but I'm not going there first. First, I'm going to Colossians 3, verse 14. We 
We are adding things to our faith. And the final thing that he tells us to add to our faith is charity. And we read here in, in Colossians 3 and verse 14, And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Notice above all these things, we are to put on charity, which makes a perfect bond. Charity ties these things together. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 13 and see how charity ties all these things together. First Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 4. Charity suffereth long. In other words, charity is patient and is kind. It has brotherly kindness. Charity envieth not. It's temperate. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Charity uses knowledge aright. It does not let knowledge bring pride into its life. It does not behave itself unseemly. Charity is virtuous. Seeketh not her own. There's brotherly love again. Honor preferring one above another. Is not easily provoked. There again is temperance. Thinketh no evil. It's godly. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Here again, charity is patient. Believeth all things. Charity is definitely connected with our faith. Hopeth all things and endureth all things. There again, it shows patience. And finally, the first part of verse 8. Charity never faileth. Charity is sure. Notice how charity ties all these things together. When you put on charity, you put all these things on. If there's anything that we missed in that list, charity is sure to cover it. Now, we've seen the benefits by adding these things to our faith, which are fruitfulness in our lives. We'll have sight. We'll have sight of our sins forgiven. We'll have sight of where we're going. Our eyes will not be focused on this present world. By adding these things to our faith, we'll have assurance of our election and of our calling. And we'll have an entering abundantly into the kingdom of Christ. In other words, we'll be able to participate in this church in a way that we couldn't without adding these things to it. We'll be able to get into the real essence of what this thing can be in our lives. And we've seen the foundation that we add to, which is the proper kind of faith. We add to a faith that is obtained by the righteousness of God. We notice that we've been given all these things through the knowledge of Him. We've examined these things one by one to see what they are. Now, I would like to exhort you to give diligence that these things may both be in you and abound. I thank you for your time.